Good morning, everyone, or good evening. Uh, welcome to the last day of the Zero Emission Solution Conference at, in the sidelines of COP26. First of all, I'd like to thank the SDSN and organisers of this conference, <coughs> which is proving to be a huge success. We are delighted that you have all joined us here today this important panel exploring solutions to bridge oceans and climate action. I'm Sally Bache with Climate Works Australia and Monash University, and I have the pleasure of moderating this session. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the tra traditional owners and elders past and present, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation from where I am speaking to you today. Today's sessions all revolve around the topic of nature. This is the first session of the day and is concerned with priorities in ocean climate inclusion. After many years at the periphery, the climate talks in 2019 saw the oceans for the first time ever mentioned in the UNFCCC output document. This led to it being termed the Blue COP and to the convening of a dialogue on oceans and climate change under one of the subsidiary we are here today as part of building momentum for the inclusion of oceans in the climate regime. For too long, oceans has been marginalised, considered a buffer to climate change, and inadequate recognition has been paid to the grave impacts that have been caused by the high level of heat and CO2 absorption by the oceans. Climate change has altered the ocean chemistry, biology, and had critical impacts upon those who live near and rely upon the ocean for their livelihoods. Also lacking has been an understanding of the substantial mitigation opportunities offered by maritime industries and ocean technologies and ecosystems. Today, we're talking with the three expert panelists across this wide area about how we can raise ongoing ocean ambition and turn it from an afterthought to a centerpiece of the climate talks. Before I introduce our first speaker, a point of housekeeping, we welcome questions today Please submit these in the Q&A area and we'll get to as many of them as we can. And now we turn to our first speaker. Russell Reichert has played a leading role in Australia and overseas in marine science, management and conservation, for which he was recognised with an Order of Australia several years ago. He is currently the Australian Sherpa representing the Prime Minister to the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Oceans Economy, a group of 14 nations and growing which has been vocal about the role of oceans as not a victim, but as a climate solution. Russell is also a current serving member of the Australian Advisory Climate Change Authority. Prior to this, he had roles leading <laughs> both the Institute of Marine Science and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And with that, I hand over to Russell. Well, thank you very much, Sally, and the organisers. Uh, it, it's the um, Sustainable Development Network. It's a terrific privilege to speak to you all. And uh, you can see in my background, I love the Great Barrier Reef. I love the ocean. And um, this is where I did my uh, graduate studies uh, some 40 years ago. And um, it uh, remains close to my heart, but not as close as the saltwater people of Australia and the traditional owners. Uh, I want to pay my respects to the Ugambi people on whose country I'm talking to you from. The Australian Indigenous traditional owners are the oldest continuous living culture um, uh, on earth. And so uh, we learn so much from their traditional knowledge. But uh, on the issue of um, zero emissions, I'd like to share my screen right now and just t talk you through some issues, which are how will, what is it we have to do? How do we have to think about the ocean to achieve zero emissions? And I'll do that through the lens of the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, and um, which is hopefully uh, you can now see me, you see my uh, opening slide. Uh, it is about solutions for transformational change. And I'll be referring to the uh, sustainable ocean economy throughout. This is a quick reminder from um, um, the, the organizers, the Zero Emissions Sustainability Conference, um, have set out these goals. How, the, how do we achieve it? What are the key technology pathways? Innovative solutions for a low emissions future. And, and what, what about the partnerships uh, with all the aspects of our society? And uh, I'll touch on these. Well, look, the um, 
I have to say the ocean health is off track is if uh, uh, Peter Thompson, who's a member of our Sherpa group, he's the UN uh, Secretary General's envoy, says re, uh, repeatedly that uh, we're actually losing the battle right now to achieve the SDGs. Um, and I won't dwell too much on this because I'm sure those of you watching feel that uh, strongly as well, that we have significant biodiversity declines. We will lose uh, food yield if we continue overfishing and we are increasing plastic at an alarming rate you know, as pollution. And uh, uh, I'd be wrong not to mention acidification and global warming will radically alter the ocean ecosystems. And I know that personally, having grown up on the Great Barrier Reef, it is in extreme, uh, in extreme danger, it's in, at risk. And so um, we need to reverse this. What can a healthy ocean give us? It can give us a lot more food, uh, these are all st uh, statistics from our 250 scientific experts led by um, Jane Lubchenco and um, Peter Horgan. And also uh, there's been a lot of, this, th these are underpinned by uh, uh, quite, quite a lot of scientific research. But um, we, can, we can produce a lot more renewable energy. We can reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, we can actually provide 20% of the reductions needed to achieve the 1.5. Um, can come from ocean energy, a lot of employment and a lot of benefits to investors as well. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll include some links in this slideshow that I'm happy to share through through the um, the organisers uh, if you uh, to save you taking a lot of notes. And I refer you to the oceanpanel.org website on these slides as a good good reference. Um, now the panel the panel is uh, shown here, and it's a very diverse group. Um, from uh, we have developing countries, less developed countries. We've got Africa, Americas, uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, and um, and recently, uh, like as in this week, um, the president of the United States announced that uh, uh, the USA will join. Um, France has made an announcement some months ago, and still to be confirmed, and possibly others will join the thirteen first members. Um, our, our Prime Minister is proud to be a, uh, a member of the panel and, and it gives us, a, a, our focus tends to be on our, uh, our region, the Indo-Pacific and our northern neighbours, especially Indonesia. It's great to have Mubarak here to speak about his experiences. So it's, a, it's and the thing to tell you is it's not a UN body, it's personal membership of these leaders. Uh, they're passionately committed to the mission, where, which is to essentially create a sustainable ocean economy where there is effective protection, sustainable production and equitable prosperity where they go together. We need all three uh, for people, for nature and the economy. Um, there's a, a great publication, uh, I'm very proud to have been involved with my colleagues and, and to uh, support our leaders to produce uh, the transformations for a sustainable ocean economy. And uh, Mubarak, I work closely with Indonesian fisheries colleagues uh, on this and also uh, the Blue Carbon Group you, you'll be speaking about. Um, this document is the vision and it also talks about the actions. How will we get there? It addresses the, uh, the fact that we cannot have a sustainable ocean economy without a healthy ocean. It, it, it's a necessary uh, precondition. Um, Wealth is important uh, and it needs to be equitable wealth. Um, we can grow our industries and we need to respect the rights of, of all people uh, through equ equitable benefits. Capital is important. Underpinning it, and these five pillars uh, stand on ocean knowledge, we need evidence. We need to be science driven. Uh, we need innovation. We need to capture the benefits of uh, where, our, where our new science can help us deliver the goals. Um, I want to talk to you about the, f that was the first phase of the panel to produce that transformations report. Now we're talking about phase two of the panel. This phase will, will conclude at the UN Ocean Conference uh, mid next year. Uh, and phase two uh, is already being discussed amongst my colleagues, um, the Sherpas, with um, looking at what, what actions can we take? What, what, how can we encourage different groups and partners uh, just as the initial slide from um, the Zero Emissions Sustainability uh, organisers uh, mentioned, it, no single sector, no single uh, 
part of our community, whether it's government, industry, not-for-profit, philanthropy, indigenous um, society as a whole uh, in different ways can play a role. So we've got here, here are 10 action coalitions that um, we're um, uh, are already in, in the process of either forming. Some are quite mature ocean, and these are some uh, very driven by private sector like ocean renewable energy um, was uh, announced before the transformations document. And it, it's a large coalition of many billions of dollars of investment in offshore wind, particularly in different parts of the world. Uh, the International Chamber of Shipping announced the, uh, that its members, um, which represent 80%, 80% of all shipping and transport in their, their membership, are committed now to a process of decarbonisation and rapid transformation away from fossil fuels. Um, other other, uh, other, other um, of these uh, efforts are not so visible to everybody, like the Global Ocean Accounting Pro Program, uh, led with Canada and Australia, but it's about accounting for nature. It's about how do we put the, the proper benefits and worth, wealth of, that comes from ecosystem services to people. Um, so there's, I've just given you some examples. There's others, tourism, blue finance, uh, blue carbon, and so on. Uh, so we can talk more about those perhaps later. Um, I do want to mention Australia is particularly, uh, my, all of my scientific colleagues and the Indigenous people and uh, the state governments are very passionate about the protecting and restoring our blue carbon ecosystems. This is just a personal note about Australia. Um, these figures are now out of date. The 3 billion tonne uh, of carbon is, is probably a gross underestimate. Uh, we have very large mangrove areas still intact and, and some areas to be restored, tidal marshes. And I, I heard this week the seagrasses, 5 to 9 million hectares, uh, the seagrass in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area is, I think, 11% of the world seagrass. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's got extensive... Uh, continental shelf covered in seagrass. So Australia, from where I come from, is passionate about blue carbon. Um, we're working, I'm working on that now. So look, the giving it 100% is a tagline from the panel. And it was really uh, a way of saying in a few words, we all, not just the panel members, but all countries with uh, economic zones uh, should be working hard to look after the ocean and properly manage it. Uh, if all of the members, this is before the US joined, uh, that would represent 30% of the world's economic zones. And uh, we also, the Ocean Panel also uh, supports the 30% by 2030 protection. Um, look, that's, um, I think I've uh, come to the end of my comments. Um, I did want to um, uh, mention, I'm seeing if the slide is missed in my, uh, this one here, I think I skipped past this one. Uh, this is the how. How do you do coastal restoration and aquaculture? Uh, how can you have renewable energy uh, and fuel food production? The thinking behind this is that individual sectors will make advances, like the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Centre in Southern Australia, by joining sectors. So instead of, uh, and I've heard uh, Sally, your co colleagues in uh, Climate Works uh, talk about this, uh, we need to set bold ambition for rapid change. And if you uh, say, uh, if you're a little bit overweight, that you're going to lose 500 grams a year, uh, you'll never get there. In your, if you say you're going to lose 10 kilos next in five months, you will. It, it, that's uh, uh, an example I got from Climate Works. But um, the um, uh, you need to set ambitious goals. That's what drives innovation. And even better, as my colleagues in systemic, Martin Stushtai said, if you can combine multiple sectors, you get transformational. It, it's, it's not incremental change, it's exponential. And so food production with renewable energy, people are working on that everywhere uh, in different uh, ocean basins. In, in Tasmania, they're looking at using uh, offshore production of salmon, for instance, uh, fueled by uh, green energy to uh, process with art artificial intelligence as well. There's other examples there, cheaper fuel, uh, green fuel, low carbon fuel, green ports, hydrogen hubs, renewable energy and recycling, 
and also finance and equity. These are just some examples where sectors can work together to get a step change to, to get us to zero emissions. I think I'll stop there, Sally. Thank you very much. Thanks stop a lot, sharing Ralph. my screen. Great, thank you, thank you. That was incredibly interesting. Um, and it's really nice to hear about the second phase of the panel and that it's going ahead uh, stronger than ever before. Um, we are going to hold questions to the end and we are going to go across to our second speaker now. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Janine Felsen today. Janine is an ambassador of Belize and an advisor to the Alliance of Small Island States and the Caribbean Community on Climate and Ocean Matters. For over 20 years, she has been a leading voice for small island developing states in key negotiations, including the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Paris Agreement, and the Intergovernmental Conference for a New High Seas Treaty on Marine Biological Diversity. Janine has served as an expert on and facilitated for several UN bodies in the fields of human rights, international law, and climate change, and was recently appointed a member of the board of the Green Climate Fund. She's concurrently an Enterprise Fellow with the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute, where she's focused on integrated approaches to global policy making on climate, oceans and sustainable development. Thanks, Janine. Thank you very much, Sally, and I hope you're able to hear me. I am at the COP in Glasgow, and it is quite an active space, um, notwithstanding the context within which we're meeting. It's a pleasure to follow Russell as well. Um, I'm from Belize, as you mentioned, and Belize also has a barrier reef, which is part of the World Heritage System of UNESCO. And we're very proud of it, um, but it is a reef that is under threat, under siege, as my prime minister recently stated um, to the COP because of climate change. And there's no question about it. But let's get to the issue of the ocean climate nexus. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that case has been filed. It's accepted that ocean action is climate action. What needs to be the po um, point of focus now is operationalization and upper operationalization in terms of the support that would be needed for that ocean action to be maximized, be optimized be in order to support climate solutions. Um, we know, and, and as uh, Russell just pointed out, ocean action can have both mitigation. It can also have adaptation co-benefits because there are so many people who already depend on marine and coastal um, services. Um, in the billions, and that is part of those people's uh, livelihood. There's also an integral um, part of the ocean to national identity. So Russell spoke about um, First Nation people. Um, in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, the ocean, the marine um, identity is very strong. It's part of who we are. It's our national identity. So these are important aspects that also um, need to be taken into account when we're talking about ocean action as climate action. Climate action isn't just about environment, it's about people. Um, I want to um, take the point of the, uh, the perspective of the small island developing states who are indeed pioneers um, of climate solutions in oceans, in ecosystem-based approaches for uh, climate. And we've been doing this for years. Um, it's not just because of uh, the Paris Agreement, it's not just because of the UNFCCC, uh, the UN United Nations Framework Convention, that we are doing climate um, solutions or taking climate solutions. It's just part of what we need to do in order to adapt and ensure that our people have sustainable livelihoods. Um, but since we talk about Paris, um, let's talk about what's happening there. And I want to uh, mention uh, what Belize has been doing uh, in its own climate plan. So it submitted a new nationally determined contribution, which significantly expands uh, coverage of um, not just our forests, but also our marine um, ecosystem and um, coastal areas. This is very important. Um, and it's um, it, consistent with one of a, a major announcement that was recently made, um, where Belize launched the largest blue bond initiative at a value of something to, of, um, in the order of $360 million. It's the largest blue bond initiative after um, uh, since Seychelles, another small island developing state, uh, launched the first blue bond initiative. Here again is that leadership, the pioneering leadership of um, small island developing states. So as part of that initiative, 
uh, Belize will expand its marine protected areas, which currently stand at 50% of, of our um, territory, to 30% by 2026. So we're, we've blown past that 30 by 30. Um, and I would like to say that that's also the case in the Seychelles. They've already gone 30 by 30, and they're looking even to go beyond that. So in the case of small island development states, we have already integrated ocean action as part of our climate action and conservation. I think that's really a, a point that I want to also hone in on, conservation as part of climate action. It's very significant um, in, in our case. And it's really important also to bring that point out because it also demonstrates how integral small island development states are to the overall global climate response. And, and, and it gets to this other um, part that I want to address, which is these are national efforts. Um, these were done under debt for climate swap uh, arrangement um, in the case of Belize and in the case of, of the Seychelles. Um, so they're essentially domestic efforts to mobilize finance. And in this case, it's not just mobilization of finance, it's creating fiscal space because many um, need to be aware that small island development states are experience very high debt to GDP ratio. For instance, in the case of Belize, we're at double the threshold of what would be considered sustainably, um, debt sustainability, would be considered for debt sustainability. And, and, and one would think, well, why is that? It's been shown in report after report, um, including most recently by the OECD, that small island development states, like other vulnerable countries, have to pay for the climate action. We are being given loans for us to carry out the responses to something that we didn't create. Because when you put all the climate, uh, small island developing states together, 44 countries, we contribute less than a percentage of global greenhouse gas emissions. In the Caribbean, 14 Caribbean uh, members, uh, members of the Caribbean community, less than 0.2% Point zero two percent sorry, of, of climate change, uh, go, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So what needs to happen is that there needs to be an international support mechanism for small island developing states who want to do these ocean actions. So you look at the climate funds and what their strategic approaches are. I'm talking about the Green Climate Fund and it, it's, it's not significantly capitalized and it's also overstretched. But that one is an area where we could tap into. Currently, we can look beyond the climate regime. We could look to the uh, green, the global environment facility, which also covers um, part of the climate regime, but it covers as well um, the other environmental agreements. And they're currently going through a replenishment process. And it would be a tremendous boon boost to uh, um, ocean action if the um, the pie, the piece of the pie that addresses ocean could be extended or expanded um, to address these areas. Um, I think I also want to address um, the importance of ensuring that um, we're not once again repeating the mistakes of the past and just making finance available at a cost to small island development states. So, you know, grant based financing, public climate financing is really important. Yes, we speak a lot about the private sector, but when you think of small island developing states with this economies of scale, with already high risk profiles because we are highly vulnerable to climate change, it's not easy to tap into the private sector. So we need to ensure that the channel and the sources of funding still um, uh, go back to the public sources of, of um, financing. And a final point, because we have others on the panel, um, looking beyond national jurisdiction. So the ocean covers 70% of the um, Earth's surface, but a lot of that is actually in areas beyond national jurisdiction, the high seas. And if we did nothing about that, then we effectively could write ourselves off the planet because the oceans are life, the ocean is a life support system. The high seas is essentially carrying all that carbon, all the uh, that's in the air, it's, it's, it's serving as a sink. It also helps with or weather circulation patterns of the ocean is important for that. 
Russell pointed to all the different aspects of you know, what we gain from, from a healthy ocean. Um, but we can't actually do that if we leave out the areas beyond national jurisdiction. So there's a new treaty that's being negotiated. The um, High Seas Treaty on Marine Biodiversity it has a very long name. We, we condense it to BBNJ, um, but too many acronyms in every process. So let's call it the High Seas Treaty for now. That's being negotiated. And I think it's really important that we consider now how uh, a, a treaty of that nature that deals with an area that belongs to no one and belongs to everyone, how we can envision a framework that will accelerate an, a collective response with adequate collective support. And I'll end it at that. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you for that. It was um, really interesting. And it's um, heartening to hear about Belize's blue bond because the first one from Seychelles has been a, a bit of time that has mm -hmm. passed. So that growing a critical mass of countries that have successfully engaged with that process is a really fabulous thing to hear is happening. Um, I'm going to move on because I know Janine has to leave um, on the next hour um, and introduce our final speaker for today. Um, Mubarak Ahmed is Indonesian Country Director of Conservation Strategy Fund. Um, SF, for those who don't know, builds the capacity of the community of change makers, both inside and outside of government agencies, in policy analysis and design from sustainability, economics and governance. Mubarak holds a PhD in Natural Resources and Environmental Economics and teaches at both the Faculty of Economics and the School of Environment in the University of Indonesia. Prior to joining CSF, Mubarak worked as a senior environment economist with the World Bank and jointly led the strategy working group at Indonesia's Red Plus Task Force. He's also worked with the WWF, the Indonesia Equal Labeling Institute, and served as a member of the World Economic Forum's Council on Ecosystem and Biodiversity, all whilst also on the editorial board of Elsevier's Journal of Forest Policy and Economics. We are thrilled that he has the time for us today because that is an incredibly busy agenda that you have and look forward to hearing from you, Mubarak. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, for the um, introductions. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Um, uh, Thanks for the organizer for bringing me into this panel um, and uh, to share a few things about uh, what I think is important as a, as, a, as a way to to advance the agenda of the adoptions of uh, ocean climate actions into the uh, at the national as well as at the country level. So I, I would like to uh, share my slides in here. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, this uh, goes to the very end. I don't know why. Okay, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm uh, my my presentation is structured into a very simple form. The first one is the some background uh, on at the international stage as well as at, at the. Indonesian states, and then uh, how does it relate to the potential um, uh, needed decisions, uh, be it at the uh, UNFCC COP as well as at the country level. Uh, in this case, of course, Indonesia. I'm using Indonesia situations as a way to to try to to put things on the table that can perhaps be relevant so not just for Indonesia but also for other countries uh, in the UNFCC uh, UNFCCC community. So uh, I'm sure everyone uh, is aware about this report. This is a report uh, on ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. <clears throat> this is the, the most recent report on the uh, impact of ocean um, uh, climate change uh, to, to the ecosystem and, and, and the, the next level of impacts uh, through that. So I'm, I'm citing here one uh, graph from that uh, report in which it shows the potential benefits uh, if mitigation is taking place uh, uh, between now and into, and into the future. So this is the future they're putting here is 200, uh, 2050 as well as 2100. Um, basically, uh, in terms of uh, warming impacts, uh, the reports uh, highlight some of the very important uh, uh, 
effect on on the ecosystem and on the human uh, system, uh, livelihood, livelihood system. The first one is the, of course, the the impact on the marine and coastal ecosystem itself. There will be acidifications, uh, changing in the ocean dynamics about the the upwelling and all this te this technical stuff, and this all impacts the biodiversity as well as the uh, the stability of the climate, and then that could create some some uh, potential uh, problems with the climatic situation, in which there will be more increasing. Will, there will be increasing incidence of storms, uh, upsurging of of waves and things like that. And of course, sea level rise. Everybody knows about that. The, and uh, small countries uh, are very nervous about uh, being submerged by the end of the century. And then the disasters related to this uh, this oceans uh, changing uh, climate as well as ecosystem is also uh, in front of our eyes. And then the last one uh, mentioned there quite significantly is the, the impact on the food system. Uh, with the ocean dynamics changing, there will be change in the productivity of the oceans in terms, in terms of food, system, food production as other things. And then, uh, of course, then the, the, the report leads to the issue of mitigation and adaptations as, the con as consequences that uh, each country should take uh, if we are to live uh, with the with the we still want to live in the future whether uh, we would like to reduce the the, the impact by doing mitigations um, or, or or on the other side is trying to live uh, uh, and, and adapt to the uh, changing uh, risks. <clears throat> um, and then at the uh, this is from other reports actually uh, here we also learned that uh, from a lot of scientific. Uh, literature already that uh, we know that uh, the if you compare the ecosystem uh, between boreal temperate tropical upland forest and the mangrove in the, in the Pacific it shows here uh, the 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 capacity of the uh, mangrove in in saving in storage in storing the carbon so this is just an illustrative of why this the why the mitigations as well as adaptation would be would be needed uh, so moving on to Indonesia as a background, as a brief background, um, I'm putting here uh, pictures that sort of represent Indonesia blue carbon ecosystem in which we have uh, seaweed uh, meadows, we have uh, coastal wetlands, we have uh, mangroves, we have uh, seaweed, uh, um, seaweed um, meadow. Uh, this is seaweed uh, for, for food, uh, for human food, the one on the right hand corner. The one on the left-hand corner is the, uh, the the one that dugong uh, are eating, and the uh, one at the bottom right corner is the uh, the corals uh, with the school of fish uh, consumption fish uh, in in that place. So these are part of the blue carbon ecosystem in Indonesia's uh, marine environment context. And if you look into statistics a bit deeper uh, related to the blue carbon. Um, I guess everybody knows that we have lost lot, lost a lot of our mangrove forest and also corals. But by 2015, we still have more than 3 million hectares of mangrove. This is the largest mangrove ecosystem in the world. And then more than 300,000 hectares of seagrass meadows. Um, we also have lots of coastal wetlands. Um, I don't have the information with me. I think this is not very well uh, mapped yet. And then we also have natural and cultured seaweed areas. We have uh, coral reefs. Um, uh, I think these numbers are around, but uh, not many uh, use in, not so much use in the, uh, so far in the climate discussion. And then also fishery stock. And then this is, I'm putting here fishery stocks uh, uh, deliberately as a way to, to gauge uh, discussion whether there is, whether there is an issue about putting that as part of the carbon balance calculations. And then uh, if you talk about carbon storage capacity, these are the thing that has been recorded. Mangrove, that uh, Indonesian mangrove uh, uh, store about 3.2 billion tons of carbon uh, with uh, annual mitigation capacity of 100 million ton. And then the seagrass and seaweed uh, is about 0.6 billion tons. Uh, we don't have information about corals. We don't have information about, about fishery stocks in terms of its carbon storage capacity. Um, 
And generally, uh, again, this is uh, some international numbers, uh, blue carbon total ecosystem values. If you look at the values, it's very feasible here that the that nothing match the, the uh, values of the mangrove ecosystem, uh, not even the seagrass, of course, that comes second into this. So this is just an illustrative. Um, so with respect to that the information about the uh, related to the IPCC report, as well as the Indonesia's uh, context, I suppose uh, we would need to find out, and hopefully uh, it's coming from this, uh, the so-called blue cob. Um, uh, what kind of decision will actually coming out of this this time uh, of the the of COP this time? Uh, uh, would the political agreement with on inclusion of ocean into climate action uh, uh, be out of this? Uh, if not, then why why would they call it the uh, blue COP? Um, and then um, of course after the political agreement, we would need some sort of mechanism for inclusions of ocean into climate action. There are there will be technical matters. There will be uh, uh, compensation and ma uh, slash market methods here, I put it. This is like uh, those, those uh, highlights for Indonesia case before. If we have 100 million ton per year carbon sequestration capacity, and we want to commit that uh, into this uh, mitigation, who would compensate us for that? Uh, that's only cost uh, 1.5 billion a year uh, in terms of US dollar. So um, I guess Indonesian government would be happy if someone put a, a 1.5 billion dollar a year to compensate for the for the uh, uh, mangrove ecosystem functions uh, to sequester carbon. And then uh, we don't know, uh, at least I, until today, we do not hear any specific commitment in terms of financial uh, uh, amount uh, to support the, the ocean climate uh, actions uh, uh, from the COP. Yesterday, there were three announcements about funding, but none are related to to, to action. So maybe you guys can, can update us later on this. Then in terms of Indonesia's policy context, uh, this is what is going on in Indonesia within the past uh, year. Uh, government is very progressively putting a lot of uh, policies. There is an NDC and an NSDG that commits to 2030 as, a, as the target timeline. Then the net zero emission will be achieved in 2016 uh, domestically uh, there is a lot of discussion about whether to, to, 2060 will be too late for Indonesia because most people, most experts believe, most scientific experts believe that um, this can be achieved by 2040 or 2045 by Indonesia. And then government also have this policy on sustainable blue economy. I guess this is related to what Russell has explained before. Then uh, specifically, there is quite a, a, a feasible mitigation policy government is uh, doing large scale mangrove rehabilitation starting this year. And then also a little bit of coral reef rehabilitation. Uh, on the adaptation side, government is uh, doing uh, coastal zone protection as part of what they have been doing um, in the past. And also uh, ecosystem, more ecosystem uh, conservation and restoration. So this is related to the NDC uh, and then the net zero uh, policy. The other one here is that um, uh, the 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 one that you saw uh, in the previous slide is the uh, one that has been officiated as government policy through the uh, coordinating points of uh, all um, um, development policies, which is with the national planning agency. This one and the slide after this are informations coming out of the coordinating ministry of um, maritime affairs and investment. So this is uh, how they uh, are foreseeing the implementations of these big policies into the government uh, regulatory framework. So um, there are legal bases already. There are Paris Agreement that has been adopted as a, as a law in Indonesia. Um, so the four uh, big items uh, in, in the middle are the one that government is trying to do more specifically at the moment. Restoration and conservation, public awareness building, as well as capacity building, uh, and then also to trying to, to uh, get the information right through a, a more integrated database system. And then the, the uh, BAPNAS, the planning agency is working very well with this coordinating ministry, uh, coordinating all those five ministries uh, uh, in the right hand side, and then trying to get it to the district. But um, I think, um, uh, the, uh, my understanding is that at this point, 
coordinating happens at the central level or, uh, only, not yet going to the province and, and district. So uh, this is a much more the delicate uh, picture of what government plans to do, but uh, this is just an illustration, so we don't need to go through it. Um, so as I see it, what are the key levels for change for countries like Indonesia uh, as a way to uh, govern the, the ocean uh, uh, ecosystem better uh, for, for, for all of us, not just for the Indonesian. So the first one is that uh, I would say a better integration of landscape and oceanscape climate policy system is needed. Uh, uh, the government is doing it at the moment through spatial planning. Uh, the, the, the landscape based spatial plan is uh, trying to be integrated and synchronized with the uh, marine spatial plan. Uh, government is also in the middle of trying to identify the blue carbon potentials and mapping it. Uh, uh, blue carbon accounting and valuation uh, as at early stage, I would say. Uh, adoption into NDC and net zero plan are not, uh, is not quite feasible yet at the moment, but that needs to be there if we are talking seriously about uh, 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 ocean climate action. Then, um, the next level would be uh, the need to adopt NDC and then zero into sub-national uh, development planning and budgetary system. Uh, the second big ticket item there is that the uh, integrative sustainable blue economy, uh, integration in, uh, integrating it into development policy is also important. Uh, government keeps talking about using the fisheries management area as, as a platform for a sub-national planning using the, the marine ecosystem as the base uh, and then this is yet to be implemented uh, in a more meaningful way in Indonesia. But we do believe that uh, if this is uh, uh, being significantly uh, improved, then we have a better future in terms of uh, sustainable uh, blue economy or sustainable ocean economy, if you like. Uh, protected area management has always been a challenge in Indonesia. Uh, government has a 20, 24 million hectares at the moment as a way to reach the 3030 target but uh, the priority is to improve the effectiveness of this uh, management within the existing part. And then uh, alignment of, of investment with mitigation policy is also highly needed in the context of developing this uh, blue economy. Uh, the second part here about the, the items for the, um, uh, that will significantly change the playground for, for improving policy is that um, this investment in capacity and knowledge system. This is a human-oriented uh, investment, human capacity investment. Uh, public awareness and education needs to be better tailored for this purpose. And also uh, capacity of planners and policymakers needs to be built. Last point is that the financial mob financing mobilization. Um, government has committed actually uh, to some extent uh, uh, doing um, allocating the budgetary system um, uh, in line with the climate policy. And then they have uh, the so-called budget tagging system as a way to, to monitor the implementation. Um, on carbon compensation system, of course, uh, the market and non-market uh, measure has yet to be defined. And then I think uh, before it can be implemented at country level, then the UNFCC decision is needed. Then blend, blended finance. This is something I think uh, I would like to put uh, a strong footnote about the role of private sector here, uh, because uh, 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 countries and governments uh, tend to be to be obsessed about scaling up uh, in achieving sustainability, but public sector doesn't have enough money, and philanthropic sector doesn't support enough. So there is the entry point why we need the the private sector. But of course, we know private sector are there to make money, to make profit. So they would always find ways to, to make profit out of the, uh, of the opportunity of investment. Uh, although they said, we, uh, we would like to use our money to, to, to uh, uh, maintain the sustainability, but what, what's in it for us? And this is the tricky point in which country can get trapped into, into, um, into um, selling. Uh, more uh, their resources uh, uh, unsustainably to the private sector. A lot of tricky points needs to be uh, considered there. This is in line, I think, with what Russell was saying before. 
proper resource governance is, is is absolutely necessary in this and also the 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 free power from consent as part of the governance system needs to be there on consent. of course then the, the my very last point here is that is uh, alignment of climate change and investment policies you know um, as a developing country is uh, we are we are we still need a lot of investments for growth uh, but uh, as you see and even if you you see controversies along around news of uh, government policies uh, in the, in cop about uh, how should indonesian align better their their uh, climate change policy with the investment policy so this is the one of the big homework for us in indonesia so i think if those things can be aligned better i think we will have a better so I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Varad. Um, all right. So we've got a few questions that have come in, but I know we've only got Janine for a short length of time at the moment. So I'm going to actually direct one to her initially. Um, Janine, you mentioned that there's been a move in towards the acceptance of there being an ocean climate nexus and it needs to be part of the climate discussions. But how do we move from that to actually operationalizing it? I understand the small island states are doing a lot of work, but there are a lot of states that aren't doing a whole lot in that area. And where do we need to look next to actually extend that? Thank you very much. So the, the climate system, uh, sorry, the climate um, negotiating process is has a very huge agenda. Um, and it covers, it has already established um, uh, uh, items that include um, science. Um, uh, so the, um, sorry, I'm not sure if there was a question. Should I continue? Yeah, please. Okay, sorry about that. Yes. Um, so there, there's a way to um, bring up some of these issues. Uh, for instance, in what is termed the research and systematic observation. Um, considerations in the climate process. So that will look at the science, um, which could include, of course, ocean related type um, um, science um, for consideration as to how that can contribute to the goals of the Paris Agreement or the ultimate objective of the um, framework convention. Um, there's also a push this year at this COP uh, to have a specific reference to um, oceans in the, the omnibus resolution that comes out of the COP. Um, to bring attention, political attention, essentially, um, to that. Um, and as I mentioned during the, the discussion, um, there's already uh, uh, examples of countries um, putting ocean in their nationally determined contribution. So once the whole process of reporting comes out, uh, measured against the global stock take, uh, which will happen every five years, starting with 2023, um, that, that will in itself create a practical um, uh, channel or practical platform uh, to highlight ocean action in the context of climate action. Um, one thing that needs to be underscored is that the Paris Agreement is not a top-down um, type of agreement. It doesn't prescribe action. It comes from the bottom up. So as much as you know, there can be sharing of information on uh, activities that countries are doing, ultimately, as we saw with Mubarak's um, presentation, it has to be integrated in what countries put on the table for their climate plans. And for some, not all countries, because you do have landlocked countries, um, for some countries, you will be able to integrate um, ocean uh, plans into your climate plans. And we hope that that will be something that, that um, countries will, will see the benefit of through some of the pioneering activities from countries like the small island developing states or Indonesia in the case um, that it will address um, that, that area. Um, but I also think there, there's a way to incentivize um, ocean action, which is why I mentioned the climate funds. I think that operationalization is through investment, it is through financing. And one of the key um, uh, pillars of the United Nations Framework Convention is that there should be support provided to developing countries to implement climate actions. And one of the channels to do that is through the Green Climate Fund, which sets out its strategic areas of focus um, and it'll do so based on its replenishment processes. And it would be good to see advocacy within that body, so through the board, for oceans to be part of the strategic priorities 
for that fund. Similarly, with the global environmental facility. Um, so, you know, I think there are ways, there are many different avenues. It can be through the process. It can be through the climate plans from the national institutions. It can be through the climate funds. Um, there are multiple opportunities to do that. And I think we're at a point where because that case has been filed, we're at a point where we can now just, we just need that political signal to keep going. Um, but let it not stop at climate. You have the biodiversity framework. That biodiversity framework, as we heard a couple of weeks ago, will now have a new fund. And that fund necessarily will be linked to the framework and implementation of the um, post-2020 framework. And oceans is, that's, that's one of the component of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Let's, let's see how we can have complementarity across these different platforms to ensure that we do get the, the necessary investment into um, ocean action. So I will leave it at that. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions, but I do unfortunately have to leave in, in about eight minutes. Thanks, Janine. That was a, a very comprehensive answer as well, so that's fabulous. I don't know if either of our spe other speakers want to take up any of the points that Janine's mentioned there. Varick, shall I? Yes, please. Yeah, please. Um, uh, yeah I, uh, that's a very comprehensive answer. Thank you, Janine. Um, mm. You know, I, my uh, uh, my sense is that innovative finance is rapidly advancing. Um, where, uh, the commitments in COP twenty six, uh, you know, through um, you know, with uh, Mark Carney and others, you know, there's there's been massive increases in in general commitment to uh, the decarbonising agenda. But I, I agree with you; it's beyond climate. I mean, we need to. Um, yeah, I, if I could tell a personal anecdote, my colleague uh, Ruth from Kenya, my Sherpa colleague, I was talking about uh, boosting productivity and uh, sharing the benefits of increased food production and commercialization. And uh, she brought me down to earth by telling me in my country, um, food is very important. So is the ocean, but the issue is hunger. The issue is uh, uh, loss of livelihood is, uh, and where when you have hunger, you have anger, and, and th th these are social issues that are intimately linked with the health of the ocean, the food production. Um, so people are, are critical, and so the systems that uh, protect and restore coastal systems. My colleague uh, from Indonesia, Barak, in, in the panel talked mm -hmm. about IUU fishing, illegal, unregulated, yeah. unreported fishing, but said equally important is coastal mm -hmm. livelihoods, uh, poverty. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we need systems of financing that uh, mm -hmm. the blue bonds and uh, fantastic news about Belize, thank you. Uh, but it was, um, has to integrate the equity, has to integrate the well-being in mm -hmm. a very general way for mm -hmm. multiple cultures by but do it by reducing emissions, improving uh, uh, livelihoods, and just the well-being of people. So I say put people in this equation with the financing and the restorations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, if I could add just uh, one one small point, which is about the uh, the life uh, the people's livelihood. Uh, my my primary concern at the moment with the entry of private funds into this uh, issue is the uh, the 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 demand for territorial uh, rights, exclusive territorial right uh, for fishing, under the pretext that okay we will protect the 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 protect area effectively, uh, and then so we can fish uh, uh, exclusively in the area, and then we promise you millions of dollars of profit to finance the protected area. And that is very dangerous propositions, but this is being put out by private sectors around here. So um, I'm I'm very uh, uh, concerned about that, uh, and then uh, uh, trying to build awareness. Uh, so as as Russell said, equity should be in the forefront uh, when we are talking about about uh, for a livelihood system. Sally, can I just jump in right there because I think Absolutely. I totally agree. Um, that 
when we talk about blue economy, when we talk about uh, mitigation, any type of action, it really does need to have an inclusive component. Um, equity, of course, being a part of that conversation. Um, and so that's where I guess I have some challenges with um, a completely decentralized approach to promoting um, action because you then you don't have the oversight. It's, it's part of the, the criticism that has been brought against the Mark Carney initiatives on voluntary carbon markets and the um, net zero alliance is that you're essentially, as we say in the Caribbean, put in the fox to mine the chicken coop. And you need to have some type of ability to monitor um, that you know, these commitments that are being made, they're actually being made um, in preserving environmental integrity and ensuring that people benefit. And that's really critical. Um, I just forgot to mention about the, the markets issue that Mubarak um, mentioned, and that's something that's being discussed here. There are already markets, um, voluntary carbon markets um, at play. And um, I think it's really critical that the rules that come out of this COP, so thanks Mubarak for putting that there, that the rules that come out from this COP ensures that there will be environmental integrity. Um, uh, it will um, necessarily address issues like blue carbon in addition to um, other aspects, but, but really critical it will be, it, it will be ensuring that there's a robust framework to ensure environmental integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, while we've got Janine for a brief length of time, I'm going to ask one of the questions that we received in the Q&A, which relates to the 30 by 30 target and the risk for the remaining 70% of the ocean. Um, but the part of the question that grabbed my attention is what kind of conservation status would apply to the 30% protected area um, to achieve both climate and biodiversity goals? Um, do you want to touch on that before you have to leave us? Yeah, um, I think that's really um, a great question. I think the, 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 there's also a lot of question marks about what um, a collective 30 by 30 goal means in, in practice. Um, but you know, one of the, one of the things that um, has been on the negotiating table for some time now is this idea of the area-based management tools. And there's an, a lot of emphasis, of course, comes on marine protected areas which can have multiple um, thresholds of, of protection, could be complete protection, and then there are other modified areas. But that is one of the, one of the tool in the toolbox. Um, but there are other areas in terms of policies that could address some even potentially sustainable fisheries um, that can be used to, to implement a 30 by 30 um, uh, um, uh, to goal or target. Um, what's critical? What is critical is that it's not just a paper park or a paper protected area. It has to be, there has to be a framework for monitoring and evaluating what's happening with, with those, um, whatever activity um, or approach is taken to promote um, conservation and sustainable use, wherever, if it's, if it's in the high seas or if it's, if it's, at, if it's at home, it, there just needs to be proper monitoring and evaluation. So we don't end up with with some nice figures, but no actual impact. Thanks. Thanks. That leads on to sort of one of the other questions. I noticed that both Russell and Mubarak in their presentations talked about sustainable ocean plans or spatial planning and the idea of how these will function and how these will interact with the existing plans under the climate system, such as the NDCs and the adaptation plans that we've already got happening. Is there a space for those to interact or will there be totally separate arrangements? Um, okay, I much. think for, uh, for, the, for the protected areas, I think uh, there, there, there will be a more uh, stringent rule oriented toward protections uh, of the resources uh, rather than the, the 70 percent part of the of the system. Um, but uh, as, as mentioned in the question as well, uh, lively, local livelihood is, is a big issue to be taken care of. So I think it should be should be uh, the, whatever the system there is should ensure the continuity of this uh, livelihood resources for the local people. And that's I think that's fundamental aspect to it. Uh, in another uh, bigger issue is on the uh, spatial plan uh, uh, 
synchro synchronization. I think this is a big challenge for us, especially as the the mining sectors. Uh, some of them started much earlier than than the issue of climate change and then the the ocean climate actions. So uh, we have places where uh, government is struggling about about alignment of uh, of uh, mining in the coastal area or near coast area vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the fish productions as well as the, the protections, uh, the protected areas issues. Um, so this is, uh, it will take some more time for us to, to get that line. But I think the, the awareness is increasing now with more uh, participations of, of private sector uh, getting into, into the dialogue. Uh, we are also hearing more and more productive dialogue. But uh, that is what we are seeing uh, in, in, the, in the, what we call it, in the sort of uh, uh, process-oriented uh, activities, how to, to, main, to align these two, these two forces. One is the, 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 the uh, private sector who wants to make profit while trying to help, and the other one is the uh, uh, stakeholders who want to make sure the sustainability aspect. Uh, but, uh, we have a bigger challenge though. I think it was put in the question there in this, I think it's a different question. Uh, how do we see the prospect of blue carbon uh, amid the trend of government policy on investment and development? So uh, it's, it's, it's very challenging. I would say it's very challenging in the this context I don't want to talk about. Uh, where, where is the meeting point between a serious uh, climate change policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the inf pro-investment policy that try to boost the, the, the economic growth. So uh, you see sometimes uh, a zigzag uh, pathways uh, along the, um, around the, the, the sustainable pathways. And, and so far we are seeing there are, there are forces try to, to bring the deviation always to the center, but uh, we, are, we, we it, it's it's yet to be seen how effective we can be in terms of pulling this uh, this um, what do you call it the the um, unfavorable pull uh, back to the central pathways toward the sustainability. I would say. Um, thank you, Mubarak. Sally, may I comment? Please, please, please. There's a lot to cover there. I'm sure you'll have some thoughts. Yeah, look, um, one of the listening to uh, I, I, many years ago, I worked with Indonesian colleagues in um, uh, the Oceanology Institute, and and um, the, uh, we were looking at Palau Seribu uh, in the Jakarta Bay, <laughs> and um, it, it struck me of just how different the challenges were for the different countries, and uh, Indonesia has. Um, uh, extremely diverse, 17,000 islands uh, in some areas of high populations. Um, and so the challenges for each country uh, in, in the high level panel are very different. So when we wrote our conclusions, we made sure that everywhere we put in some recommendations, we, we said according to national circumstance. Uh, to make sure that we recognise cultures are variable. Solutions that work in one culture will not work in another. Um, I've worked with Polynesian culture. Uh, it's very different. It's more dynamic. They allocate year to year who, who has access to different resources by the chiefs. Uh, Sally, you know this better than me probably. But um, the, um, the Western culture is different. Um, in thinking about Australian sustainable ocean planning, uh, our government hasn't set, it's committed to making one along with the other members by 2025. But the, um, the government hasn't yet settled on exactly how that would happen. Um, but uh, I think we can draw a, a lot of lessons on um, uh, essentially, uh, well, we can, uh, in the States, uh, New South Wales, uh, uh, I work with that government on their marine estate, which is the coastal waters uh, out to three miles. They have a process called threat and risk analysis. Um, it's different to the methods used to create marine parks in the Barrier Reef, for instance, where there was what they call comprehensive, adequate and representative was the uh, methodology where you look at the biodiversity, bioregions, 
Um, that works well where there's not many people. Where there's many people, uh, and the uh, coast of New South Wales has a high population, um, if you're looking at the values uh, or, or the environmental values, the natural values, um, it, it's worked out well for that government to look at the threats and risks and find local solutions, um, which I think is much more like the thinking of Indonesian colleagues. You know, there's compromises, there's things that uh, locally work in one part of the, the country and not in another. Um, there's some common elements to it. Uh, wherever possible, be evidence-based, you know, have the evidence to discuss the compromises. Um, have a concept of equity and sharing the resource. And ultimately, if I said, what's the key, uh, what's the key success factor? I would say it's leadership uh, and uh, inspiring leadership, which uh, brings multiple parties together to share resources or to prevent conflict to and allow equitable uh, benefits for uh, very, some rich people, some poor people, some, you know, the community benefit. Uh, that takes a lot of wisdom and, and um, leadership and it, and is very challenging to echo my colleague Mubarak. It's very challenging. So um, that's what I'll uh, contribute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, we know that at the moment we are entering the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And I'm wondering what difference we think that this decade will make in terms of where we're looking at the science. I know Mubarak had a number of areas with questions in the blue carbon assessments. Where are we headed and what will be the changes that we see through the implementation of this new research effort? Mubarak. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, it's, you know, uh, being, being here, uh, you know, Indonesia is a fun place. Um, uh, you see a lot of uh, diversity in the in the in, in ideas, in people, in culture, in approach, uh, including in the policy approaches. So that, that's what makes us uh, almost always zigzagging uh, uh, around the pathways towards sustainability. I would say. So sometimes uh, we see a very consistent approach. Uh, and sometimes uh, uh, we see uh, uh, a very inconsistent approach. And then again, leadership does matter. I, I do agree with that. The problem is that uh, where is the leadership taking us to? There's uh, something, uh, there's part of the uncertainty that we need to take into account. That's what, that, what's been, that has been the lesson in Indonesia's context for the last 11 years. Uh, uh, getting serious into the climate change policy, you can see it. You can you can trace um, uh, how 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 the the leadership uh, is is uh, something ch sometimes changing courses, and you you would wonder, uh, are we still going into the same direction that we declared we want to go? People, not sure sometimes. Really, I'm serious. Sometimes we, we cannot be sure about that. So. Uh, as always, uh, countries' politics are colored by the political economic choices of the leaders. And that is what, what determine the directions. Um, so I would say at this point, we are, we are in, in a challenging, uh, uh, in, in a very challenging situations to gauge uh, where is actually we are going in terms of policy. So maybe Russell would have a different uh, take on that one. Um, Sally, can I have a right of reply? Um, no, Absolutely. I, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. I, I'm not uh, familiar enough with your uh, government's uh, policy uh, to uh, comment on Indonesia, but uh, I do know that um, I, I'm a scientist by training, so I tend to think uh, we can solve it all if we just have enough data. Well, we know that's not true. <laughs> that's definitely not true. Um, so what I I come around with some experience uh, with ocean policy in Australia 25 years ago and other things that um, uh, the ambition uh, to solve the problems, uh, I, I think, needs to be a dialogue. You, know, you have the scientists, you have the uh, local people and the regional government and the federal governments, state government, uh, whatever, 
different layers of government. Um, and in some countries, the NGOs play a, a very strong role, possibly in ASEAN countries, you know, the, um, uh, differently from in Australia. But so the right people need to look at the uh, resources available, the conflicts. Um, i give you an example. If you want to put a wind farm in a shipping lane, which has been released for aquaculture development, uh, you need to be talking about that. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, a classic example of emerging industries. But if there's, and that you need to manage that space. So that's what I call spatial area management or integrated ocean management. But, um, but that might be a limited area where those things combine. Um, but if you ask a scientist, they would map the 11 million square kilometers of Australia's EZ, uh, where there's no conflict in most of it. You know? So there's not enough hours in the day or money in the bank of the government to, and industry to work everywhere. So do a threat and risk approach. There's a risk of a ship colliding with an aquaculture farm and drifting into a wind generator. That's where you should focus. Now we have to get organized and manage the space and work. Um, I would say, uh, not, not uh, my experience with Indonesia and some parts of coastal Australia. Um, what do the local people need for their livelihood? Now they, they need some return from the tourism that's happening in their area. Uh, my colleagues in Mexico were very passionate about this, that um, some forms of tourism don't leave anything behind. They, they don't leave anything with the local people. Uh, and so they call it leakage, leakage of benefit away from the people. So that's when I said put people in, uh, and that's where the local leaders, the uh, province leaders and the uh, national leaders can help put the regulation in place to look after the local people from the people that would otherwise just take the money and run away. Yeah, uh, if I can add a little bit to that, that, that is so of uh, about choices of, of uh, investment types, so to speak, like the tourism. Uh, this is uh, exactly uh, among other things that uh, my organization is promoting uh, around the world. How can we use science and including economics in presenting options for uh, decision makers uh, and, uh, and people? So one of the one of the uh, work uh, of CSF in Palau uh, was that uh, they were able to show, uh, put on the table to the government, the, the cost benefit analysis of who will actually be benefiting from uh, the choice of make uh, maintaining, keeping the tourism uh, small and, and served by the community vis, uh, versus uh, giving it a, a sophisticated large scale investment to, to international companies. And when they, uh, one decision um, factor that they really look seriously into is the percentage of, of uh, spending uh, enjoyed by the local people. And then so uh, with that, they can, they can show and, and build motivation for the, for the, for the locals. Uh, the livelihood is really depend on it and they can, they can bring and the, the the resources, the marine resources can bring them better prosperity if they manage it well. And so they make the choice. So tourism is anchored uh, in that particular area as a, as a non large scale uh, sophisticated tourism, but rather uh, uh, manage uh, very, very, uh, it's a kind of, uh, it's, it's a, what they call it? It's actually, it's, a, it's an expensive tourism, but managed by the local. And they, they make everything local. So the providers of the of the of the things enjoyed by the tourists are all local people. And and yeah. through various calculations, they manage to sort and it becomes a good choice. Sally, there's a good point to make on tourism. Sorry to butt in. Uh, that I, I, I talk to my tourism colleagues a lot here in Australia and uh, Mexico and Jamaica. And um, there is a changing market for tourists now. Uh, post COVID and, and it's um, tourists don't want to go somewhere and be not, not received well. You know, they don't want to be seen to be damaging the environment. Uh, I think the cruise ship industry is addressing this now because they, they've had problems in the past in the Caribbean. Caribbean. Um, so the market for a smaller scale 
uh, not so cheap, but giving benefit. Uh, so they're welcome. They leave something for improving the environment. They're seen as helping the local people look after the environment, not damaging and taking away. So the, that market, as according to some of my industry colleagues, is a growing, uh, growing market. People, people don't want to be a tourist uh, in a place that's beautiful, but they're not, they're not welcome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and linking from, I guess, that across into a theme that I'm hearing here from the, the, that livelihood and local focus and to an issue that one of our Q&As raised is how are these systems interfacing now with the emerging issue of plastic pollution, um, which is obviously both petroleum based and expanding as an alternate for other fossil fuel uses of the petroleum industry and has what we're finding out are growing concerns in how the plastics break down and impact the ocean and the ocean's ability to absorb uh, CO2. Have either of you got any thoughts on that area? I, I, I have some thoughts. Shall I go? Yeah, go ahead. Please do. Um, yeah, look, the plastic story, um, it boils to the Pew Foundation did a, a, a really disturbing report. Um, uh, well, now I lose track of the years with COVID, but I think it was two years ago now. Um, but um, it is a very difficult problem because most people don't realize that the main source of the resins that make most of the plastic come from methane, which is uh, a cheap uh, byproduct from the gas industry. Uh, and that um, there's probably a hundred companies that account for most of the source, but it's very cheap. It's very cheap. In fact, uh, you nearly get paid to take it. It's um, to, so virgin plastic. They call that virgin plastic, which means uh, not recycled, uh, is um, is cheaper for people that need to make a lot of plastic containers to use the raw material rather than recycle material, and. Um, I know Andrew Forrest, I was talking to him, he's a, an iron ore exporter and is looking at uh, hydrogen technology. He had an idea about uh, those hundred companies perhaps uh, imposing, imposing themselves a, a self-imposed levy to make it um, worthwhile to recycle. So reversing what you call the value chain, uh, make it just as uh, cheap to use recycled plastic, which is cost money because it's more expensive. But ultimately, I think we need new new materials um, I mean, because whether it's ma macro plastic or nanoplastic uh, crossing the blood brain barrier, my friends in uh, the Pacific tell me that you know that it's one of it's, after climate change, it's one of their biggest issues because uh, m m nanoplastics are in their diet. They eat it's in the fish, it's in their diet. So um, this is very important to uh, people highly dependent on fish and. So I think um, we need different materials. Uh, we need uh, materials that can be reused. We need Ellen MacArthur and circular economy. We, we need thinking differently about the, uh, the take it from the earth, make it into something and throw it away. We have to change that to a more traditional culture of uh, reuse, recycle. Um, and I, I, it's a very complex issue because it's so ingrained, you think, plastic only was invented less than 100 years ago. And we're already making more plastic than there are weight of humans on the planet. You know, it's, it, it's something that got away from us when we weren't looking. So, so I think it's, it's up there with climate change, something we should change uh, as soon as we can. Yeah. Uh, let me take on the, the feasible part of the plastic pollution is not the micro and uh, the micro, micro and the nanoplastics. Uh, uh, more difficult uh, to, to, to respond to. But uh, uh, in, in our context, I think in many countries, uh, we are still facing the this uh, feasible plastic pollution uh, from the waste, uh, from the inappropriate waste, waste management, I would say. Um, uh, and this is uh, herd tourism, uh, clearly. Uh, you, you see uh, about Indonesia, a lot of web publications uh, came out two years ago after somebody diving in the middle of the oceans of plastic, he called it, um, mm -hmm. and put it in YouTube and it becomes viral. But uh, the situation uh, like that usually happen uh, because lack of integratedness 
in the uh, area management or, or territorial management, I would say. Uh, if you take examples of uh, uh, National Park, uh, Bunake National Park in the North Sulawesi, uh, most plastic, uh, perhaps all, uh, well, 99.9% .9 maybe, of plastic waste in the Bunaken parks come from the island of Sulawesi, which is the city of Manado, which is right in front of it. And then it seems so obvious to us uh, uh, from as an outsider, how come they, they cannot just get the plastic at, at the river mouth uh, before it enters the sea? Well, it looks like it's a very, it's a very uh, simple and, and doable technical solution. But the fact that it, it didn't happen uh, raised a lot of questions. Um, why, why is it, why is it didn't happen? It's so like, like sounds like a very uh, simple problem to, to resolve, but uh, for years it's not yet uh, completely resolved. And then the other uh, example is Bali. Uh, part of Bali are, um, uh, part of Bali are infected by the, uh, by the uh, uh, plastic waste from Java during the, the west uh, wind season. But if the wind comes, blows from the east, there is no plastics. Uh, and that means clearly that the plastic comes from Java. Uh, um, and then what to do in that kind of situation? And uh, so this is, this is where perhaps the concept of regional blue economy, uh, which is in Indonesia context, uh, the vision so far is using the fisheries management area as a platform of coordination can work well. So um, if uh, inter-provincial government can work together using this platform to coordinate actions and, and policies to, to manage their waste, at least the feasible waste, um, then that can perhaps uh, help to get the Asian ocean much cleaner and also uh, uh, maintain the value of tourism quite high for the, for the national economy and for the local economy. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, with only a little over five minutes left, I want to leave you both with a, a very short question or any other roundup comments that you might like to make. But Mubarak made a comment in his presentation about what decision comes out of the blue cop. And it makes me wonder, what does a cop have to do to earn the right to be called blue? And what needs to come out of this to earn the right for this cop? be called a blue cop yeah uh, I've, I've been asking that question around since yesterday and, and no one <laughs> answered no one no one seems to be to feel, no one seems to feel hot enough to answer that i really wonder what um uh, the more uh, technical question would be what are the directions of a decision that is being expected coming out of the cop so it is being called blue cop no, 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 no one has answered that question. Um, so I re I, I'm really wondering. Um, and then it's been, it's been four days, right? Uh, how much is that in the agenda? I don't know. So perhaps uh, you guys who are in, in Glasgow at the moment can share some of this perspective. Uh, Mubarak, I was thinking the same thing. Um, now, <laughs> who, which, one of, which one of us is actually in Glasgow now? Um, uh, not Sally, not, none of us, but... Uh, no. Sorry, Janine is not here. She could tell us, but no, I, I, I honestly don't know. But I do think that um, some recognition and a creation of a rules, improving the nationally determined contribution assessments of blue carbon, um, assistance for um, especially developing countries with restorable blue carbon. Uh, they, I'm just brainstorming ideas that for me would tick the box of a blue cop. Uh, if some of those things were being discussed and, and especially some of the, um, uh, I mean, we, we have finance uh, uh, under the uh, TCFD, you know, the uh, Task Force on uh, uh, Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, and we have the Blue Finance Principles. Uh, yeah. So we're seeing an emergence of those, but I haven't seen them. I haven't followed enough the detail of the COP to know if they've be, uh, had any prominence in Glasgow. But uh, I would like to see uh, some acknowledgement um, out of this uh, conference that uh, the ocean uh, can be a solution to climate, build yeah. the resilience of our natural systems, and help uh, 
billions of people uh, increase their well-being and improve the uh, climate, uh, reduce the impact mm -hmm. of climate change if they are taken into account more directly in the financing mechanisms uh, and the priority setting for uh, uh, development aid and, and for uh, blended finance of uh, philanthropic and and uh, government intergovernmental and private investment uh, ethical ethical investing in ocean-based uh, yeah, enterprises definitely. that's what i like to see i don't know if they're doing it <laughs> sorry yeah, I think uh, uh, in relation to what Janine was highlighting a lot before about the role of GCF, uh, the Green Climate Fund. So yes. I, I wonder if that will get strengthened in there after this call. Uh, because um, so far, um, my personal view is that the, 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 the marine-based marine climate action is not uh, very specific and not very strong in GCF, in the Green Climate Fund uh, provisions. Yeah. Yeah. Look, and the the point about um, the, the the it's very positive to hear investment is moving away from uh, damaging uh, uh, emission. Uh, you know, the, the industries that would damage the climate goals. Um, but someone also heard a comment today that um, not all of the investors in the uh, old industries, the polluting industries, are uh, actually come through that kind of, they, they come through private equity, you know, they come through things that aren't controlled by BlackRock and by others. You know, so there's, it's very complex, uh, the finance world. So I, but I, I like where the, uh, what I've heard from the World Bank, the IFC, the development banks, and the, the intention seems strong in, in these banks that are close to the people. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Well, that draws our session to a close. I want to thank you both and Janine in absentia for your contributions in the discussion today. It was fabulous to be a part of it. Um, and I guess moving forward from here, we hope to see in a range of different ways that blue is earmarked as something that finance and other elements of climate have to attest, attend to. And that the processes such as the one Russell's involved in with the panel for the sustainable ocean economy continue to push climate as one of the issues that are so important to oceans. So thank you both for being here. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Thanks for bringing me in. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Yeah.